I'm glad you came. Just turning up shows your commitment to the process. Good. I've read your notes. The other therapist didn't work out for you. I want you to know this will be different. We take this at your pace. No notes. No drugs. No theories. We go back to the start. Understand what happened. Take a look at this short form. I promise it's the only one you'll see during your therapy. Try to answer truthfully. It's easier that way. been unfaithful? Is that true? Okay. Let's get started then. It's good that we touched on the car crash. That would have been a breakthrough before. But let's leave that topic for a while. I want to talk about family. It's important to you. For you, family is about physical affection and making your feelings known. You're giving me that look. I'm talking too much. Well, let's have you talk, or not, or whatever you feel comfortable doing. Let's play true or false. Is it true to say you're a private person? Would you say it takes a while for people to get to know you? Uh-huh. People can choose their friends, but not their family. Would you prefer to spend time with friends over family? Nothing surprising there. No. You're going to like this. On the table are some pencils and a picture. I want you to let out your inner child and color in the picture. It's titled Happy Family. finished. What a lovely family home. Is your home like this? So we get to the halcyon days of high school. When I was starting out, the popular theory said it was their mom and dad that screwed a person up. But if you really want to screw someone up, I say... Send them to high school. I bet your school locker was a real mess. You were one of those organized chaos types, right? Okay, let's move on. I'm going to throw out some words. Nod when they fit how you were at school. Shake your head if they don't. Ready? Jock. Next, slut. Uh, drunk. Ah, virgin. Hmm. 
bully. And slacker. Okay, let's take a different tack. On the table, I've laid out a blank timetable and some cards with lessons on them. Pick out the lessons to show me your perfect school day. Don't leave any empty. There are only four periods, and I've allocated a very generous lunch. Done? Nice. If that was all there was to it, it would have been a breeze, wouldn't it? Come on, let's talk more about the bad stuff that happened at school. Nasty, but inevitable. Everyone is going to die, even if we like to pretend otherwise. You could die tonight, in your sleep. Why doesn't that terrify you? How would you like to die? No, wait, let me guess. You'd like to die having sex. It's academic, really, as we're only truly conscious of death when it happens to others. Get to my age, you'll have seen plenty of people die. There, one minute, then gone. Okay, game time. There are seven pictures of people on the table. Your job is to tell me who is dead and who is merely sleeping. Divide them up. Left, dead. Right, sleeping. It's just an exercise. There's no right answer. Actually, they were all dead. Okay, let's get back to it. You feel guilty about everything. When we all lived in huts and wore furs, we worried over the simple things. Food, water, whether animals would come and eat us in the night. Now we have supermarkets, bottled water, and 38 caliber home security. So what keeps us awake at night? More often than not, guilt. If only I had acted differently. If only I hadn't said that. If only I'd said something. You beat yourself up with your past. Don't blame yourself. Blame the world. Blame God. Blame me. Okay, this is my favorite. Let me introduce some friends of mine. This is King Harold. His daughter, the chaste Celestine. A prince called Wilhelm. And a bull. He doesn't have a name. Prince Wilhelm is passionately in love with Celestine, but she does not love him. One day, Wilhelm comes to the king and asks for Celestine's hand in marriage. Celestine begs the king not to marry her to Wilhelm, but the king ignores her pleas. Royal protocol means he must say yes to the match. They are married, and Wilhelm takes Celestine back with him to his kingdom. That night, he attempts to consummate the marriage, but the distraught Celestine flees. She runs from the safety of the castle and across a field, ignoring the sign which warns of danger. In that field is a bull who, seeing the girl, charges her. She falls under his hooves and is killed instantly. What I want you to do is line the players up according to how guilty they are of Celestine's death. Whose fault was it? At the left, most culpable. To the right, most innocent. You want to hear that again?
done? Poor Celestine. She didn't have to run, right? I find the best cure for guilt is to never get caught in the first place. Let's continue. You know, I think we're getting somewhere. We're all tied up in this marriage thing. Marriage worked a lot better when we didn't live so long. We have phrases like the honeymoon is over to remind us how quickly marriage is sour. You think I'm being cynical? Divorce does that to you. Come on, you think marriage can really last? Should a couple stay together for the kids? Do you think it's a bad idea to marry young? You think sex becomes stale after marriage? You know what? You being such an expert on marriage, you're going to ace my matchmaker test. On the table are six pictures. All you have to do is sort them into three married couples. All finished. Okay. Now tell me which of those couples are still together. <laughs> I'm joking. You know I'm just trying to provoke you, right? Oh, let's keep going. We're really making progress here. We're getting deep in it now. I can almost taste it. All this talking, and we still haven't touched on the sex thing. That's what you're thinking. Aren't all psychiatrists supposed to be obsessed with sex? It's not us. It's you. You're obsessed with sex. Even when we're not talking about it, you're thinking about it. Come on, let's have some fun. See the pictures on the table. I want you to divide them up. The ones you think are a sexual symbol go on the left, the ones that aren't, the right. Good. Of course, the constant partner of sex, the other side of the same coin, is... death. Sex is death. It's a leap into the void, the great loss of self, the tiger in space, a plea for annihilation. To deny sex is to deny death itself. You know, people who are getting enough don't need analysis. You clearly are not getting enough. Let's see this through to the end. This is going nowhere. I'm spelling it out, but you're not listening. Your troubled school days? How you're conflicted about marriage? Your denial of death? The unfounded guilt? Abnormal sexuality? Eighteen years of denial. A whole universe of fantasy in that thick skull of yours. 
a skull teeming with agents of repression. Blind children clutching photos in the dark. Pale freaks goggle-eyed from watching home movies on loop. The term is complicated grief. But it's simple, isn't it? A young girl. Her parents don't get along. She blames herself, as all children do. Then daddy dies. What's a girl to do? Deny that daddy died. Deny who daddy was. What seven-year-old actually knows who their parents are anyway? So she obsesses and obsesses over this fantasy dad propping up her make-believe with scraps, scraps of a happy life that never was, scraps of a father who never existed. Wake up! Your dad wasn't a hero. Wasn't your knight in shining armor. He was a human being. You never knew him. And you never will. The dad walking around in your head isn't even a ghost. He never existed. A Frankenstein's monster, a child's fantasy. But you're alive. Your mother is alive. She's not the monster you make her out to be. You need to live your life. Cheryl. Introduce yourselves. I'm Michelle, and I'm Midwich High's prom queen. And our next star? <laughs> I'm Lisa. I'm a nurse. And I'm Harry Mason, famous author and seducer of prom queens and nurses. Can we be in your next book? Sure. Can you dedicate it to us? Nope. Dedications are always to my wife and daughter. It's only fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> 